Hello everyone, welcome to Shriram's IAS. So, I am happy I am with you here for environment. So, this is our third session. Here we will be discussing like uh, the climate change and our environmental issues we will be discussing and the measures to combat issues will be discussed session. So, before going into that, if you want to connect with us uh, in an academy platform, I will then offer call Shriram's and get an flat 20% offer in your subscription fee. As well as, uh, you know, there is a special marathon conducted for uh, the students, which is freely available. So, in view this marathon session and which is upcoming session is on 21st May for the current affairs. Okay. Stay connected for benefiting from these sessions. Now, we will move to the uh, first thing in under the climate change issues climate change and the related environmental issues we are going to see now. Okay. So, first I will begin with pollution because pollution is a issue which is uh, present everywhere. You can see that how it is going to affect, so how to define what is pollution because this is completely the entire subject we will be studying not only the current related uh, you know concepts. Okay. So, what is pollution? Pollution means any changes which is not accepted with or which is not desired by the uh, people or desired by the environment that is called as environmental pollution. That means any change in the physical or chemical or any character of the compounds like air, land, water or soil which is going to affect the uh, properties of them as well as the life forms okay which is up, which is relying on them. We also want, you know, starting from humans, you take all the other organisms are relying on these resources for their survival. And if that is threatened, then what will happen? Because pollution is the one which is threatening everything, starting from air, land, water, everything. So, this is affecting the life support system of the biosphere, that is the earth, okay? So, simple words, if I want to define, you can see here, it's nothing but pollution can be defined as any unfavorable alteration of our environment due to anthropogenic activities, due to human activities. Uh, any, uh, any topic you take, we have to start with definition as I have already gave a clear explanation for you uh, regarding that because some questions can be very much very direct uh, to you. So, they will be asking like describing that and ask what is the what is this meant by or they will give that word and ask you to pick up the definition. So, this way it will be very useful. Okay, so now we can see what are the agents which are causing this pollution, okay, that which are the agents which are bringing this undesirable changes in the environment around us. We call them as pollutants, okay, we term them as pollutants. A pollutant can be defined as any substance, okay, which, which can be a biotic substance, which can be a abiotic substance, that means which can be living organisms or which can, can be a non-living organisms also, that is, that is causing a change uh, over the components of the environment. You know, in the classes you would have definitely come across the components of the environment like land, the bio biosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere and atmosphere. The changes in any of this will leave, uh, you know, the reverse impact on the life forms. Okay. So, the agents which is causing this change is called as the pollutant. And if you see, uh, again, this uh, pollutants can be of types. We are not going to see many types of pollutants and only two types you have to remember because if you are taking any um, material, lot of way you can differentiate pollutants, gaseous pollutants, that they will be different types of pollutants. But two things you have to remember is biodegradable and biodegradable. What we call as biodegradable pollutant, what we call as non-biodegradable pollutant. Biodegradable pollutant means, see here itself we have mentioned that means, uh, which can degrade, you know, faster, fastly it will degrade or that means degrade means uh, firstly, break down, decompose. Okay, so that's called as biodegradable pen. The natural process itself it will uh, decompose. Like you can take a paper, generally paper which is derived from wood, so it will uh, decompose very fastly. So they do not pose threat to the environment like the chemical pollutant. But what is the problem if they exceed in level? That is, if input that what you are giving out, no input is greater than the decomposition capacity or the degrading capacity, then comes the problem. So, that the problem is here only when the input, 
that is when you are dumping more number of waste into the river then it can carry that uh, waste and even the biological process which the microorganisms which has to act on it uh, you know cannot uh, decompose it in the faster rate than you are dumping there okay so that is a problem which is occurring in most cases in this related to sewage and all you know, those types of waste that is the problem which is occurring so that we call as biodegradable pollutant then comes a non biodegradable pollutant what is non biodegradable pollutant that means which which the which degrade very slowly that remains longer time in the atmosphere okay in the environment either in the soil or in the air or anywhere even in our body also nowadays they are talking uh, so it lives for a longer time okay so when they released when they are released into the environment they can move anywhere and even if they are uh, they can travel longer distances also they stay for longer time also in the environment okay so these pollutants no it cannot be degraded fastly or natural process it will we cannot degrade at all that will be taking a lot of lot of lot number of years hundreds and thousands of years to get completely degraded and uh, for example you can take as we have mentioned here itself pdt and a very simple example is plastics which you are using so these all will uh, take a lot of years to get decomposed and they are posing continuously posing threats to the environment in various ways that only we are going to see today like raising the global temperature uh, uh, changing the climate completely uh, then also causing acid rains this way we are going to see lot of issues associated with uh, pollutants okay so this one you have to keep in mind the two types this much is enough regarding the types of pollutants then see what types of questions are appearing from this section how upsc is asking question if you take a old question paper you can notice that they will be giving certain uh, you know pollutant and they will give the source of that pollutant as options number 1 2 3 4 then they will ask you to choose the right option from that okay so always target this chapter in that manner only or they will be giving that this uh, uh, particular pollutant they will take or particular substance they will take which is al already uh, in discussion in the news as and a lot number of times they will give three four statements related to that and then uh, you no know, they will say this is a by product of this industry and this can be used in this 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 so this way the statements will be and they will ask you to choose the right statement from the above okay so these types of questions are coming and uh, recently what they have done they have said that you are disposing certain material what type of pollutants and all will come out of it now so uh, the pollutants which can be disposed from a material is also now asked okay this way you have to be careful while reading i have given certain uh, you know basic uh, pollutants here and the one which appeared in the newspaper recently that was given here not all the things i have given to be read by you so first we will start with the carbon dioxide the very important a very uh, uh, the you know vip member is carbon dioxide here how he is polluting the environment that and all will be studying later under the green, greenhouse gases uh, and all and so now carbon dioxide if you see the main source of carbon dioxide is nothing but the burning of fossil fuel only okay either in the industries while you are combusting the fossil fuel to generate energy or uh, or if it is used in uh, you know vehicles in the form of gases petrol diesels you are burning them and then it, the carbon dioxide is released outside or you are trying to cut down a forest carbon dioxide is released out or you are trying to uh, you know um, the decompose the limestone while you are manufacturing a cement in the cement industries carbon dioxide is released out okay or when the dead bodies are decomposed again carbon dioxide not only dead bodies all organic matters all any organic matter any organic is decomposed it releases carbon dioxide even a volcano this and all you would have studied in the cycle itself volcanic eruptions uh, all these things are going to release the carbon dioxide but the prime source is burning of fossil fuels so you have to learn like that only you have to know for this element okay which is the prime source of pollutant and what are the other sources remaining other sources which are available so in this way for this uh, pollutant i have given all these things the cement manufacturing industries and also the decomposition of organic matter volcanic eruptions okay then combustion of coal and other fuels deforestation it goes on okay students uh, yes now we'll move to the next pollutant and see this sulfur dioxide again another important uh, uh, gas which is posing a lot of threat including the acid rain you will come across this person only is sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide or sulfate any form they will get released so what are the major sources for this if you see the major source is burning of fossil fuels again here and vehicular emissions apart from that the um, smelting industries like uh, 
copper smelting you take copper smelting in a plants and all will release lot of sulfur dioxide gases outside okay because this ore contains sulfur right? so when it is it is it is trying to smelt it out all that which releases out is the sulfur dioxide then you know manufacturing of sulfuric acid also will release the sulfur related gases and even fertilizer pro producing industries right? so they also will emit sulfur gases other than this other than the smelting industries other than the, the manufacturing of sulfuric acid and fertilizer manufacture the petroleum extraction while well, they are extracting petroleum no and refining also when they are extracting and then they are trying to refine the petrol okay there also in that process completely starting from extraction to refining process there will be release of sulfur gases even you take paper manufacturing companies they also release sulfur so paper manufacturing means it is not clear and it is not very healthy and all for the environment it is also releasing lot of gases like this and even municipal incineration and uh, all the metal extraction and all whenever you are doing a metal extraction it will pollute the environment only then come to the nitrogen dioxide the third important gas which i want to discuss here the major sources burning of fuels again biomass burning the wood you are taking you are burning it and even the manufacturing industries the by product of manufacturing industries and all is will be release of nitrogen gases like how sulfur gases is released nitrogen gas will get released and again this fourth is hydrocarbons how hydrocarbons is polluting the environment like you take benzene propane butane like this uh, hydrocarbons you know we uh, we have a lot of hydrocarbons uh, how this and all is polluting the chief sources for all these pollutant will be the motor vehicles only emissions from the motor vehicles are evaporation of gasoline through carburetors you have to read this that's why i have given us a small note for you crankcase etc even uh, in already we have did, did it burning of fuels biomass municipal landfills microbial activity of the sewage when it is decomposing hydrocarbons will get released okay and also industrial process and see these two are very important and in this year there was a report released by UNEP long back they have been discussing uh, so now this was put forward before the uh, member countries that uh, you know not only uh, trying to uh, re reduce the carbon dioxide emissions will bring or will try to uh, help the member countries achieve the paris agreement goal but you also re should reduce the another important uh, greenhouse gas that is methane that level also should be reduced so this is very important lastly we will put methane and discuss separately so the chief sources of this methanes are agriculture only they themselves has released this report and also the fossil fuel operations and the waste generated okay from the sewage waste all this methane is released methane is completely continuously released and benzene is another important uh, harmful hydrocarbon which is a part of crude oil only again crude oil generations extraction all this will release benzene and the gasoline industries as well as the cigarette smoke is also having the benzene okay so this way you have to be prepared with the hydrocarbons only and then come to chlorofluorocarbon why i have put chlorofluorocarbons for you and formaldehyde all these of carbon these types of uh, cfcs we call generally we call this as ferrons why we have put up them because the one which we are going to discuss one one type of issue is ocean depletion in that they will play an important role so these substances these chemicals will reach the stratosphere stay there for longer time and how which are the sources for releasing this uh, pollutant the aerosol sprays the foams the plastics for making the disposable uh, containers and all no plas plastic plate plastic tumblers we are making no so all these while they are making it will release this all these will try to release the chlorofluorocarbons okay as well as the refrigerator is a major source and also the pressure it is this cfcs are used as pressurizing agent in the aerosol cans and for cleaning the electronic goods and all they are using a spray no in that spray this chemical is present okay so these are some of the sources of this pollutant right now uh, another important pollutant which i want to discuss is black carbon black carbon we all know about carbon dioxide and carbon but what is black carbon here in the figure itself you can see a lot of black carbon smoke is emitted out it's like a sooty material we can say you know uh, it's like a type of uh, drop solid droplets which is floating in the air so it's uh, uh, it remains in the air for around two weeks you can see you know mostly 
the people even the death in india is happening due to indoor air pollution this is how who released a report so indoor air pollution is mainly caused due to black carbon only it goes and deposit in your respiratory tract and it causes a lot of harm to the humans because the women who are cooking inside the house used to burn the wood so this type of black carbon which is a sooty material is emitted out and it is going into our lungs and it is completely damaging our lungs also apart from that it is also acting as a greenhouse gas see it remains two weeks in the atmosphere and uh, mainly even the gas engines diesel engines when the ca cars are running and it is not properly maintained then it, it will emit this black car and also household energy so the sources are these okay household energy agriculture coal fired power plant and all these are some of the sources for emitting this and this this and all the health problems associated like it will cause respiratory and cardiovascular disease cancer stroke lung cancer very rarely they will ask this so we'll move to the next one see it leads to global warming black carbon leads to global warming because it's a greenhouse gas it accelerates the melting of snow and ice when it goes and deposit over the snow and over the ice it will add, it will speed up the um, you know uh, melting of that melting of the snow and ice and what is the problem now we are the main problem we are facing is rising sea level Anna, because of this black carbon it is accelerating this uh, melting of snow and ice and increasing the sea level also and even it alters the weather pattern and rainfall and prevents the cloud from forming okay all this way it is affecting and even when it's go, go and deposits on the plant and uh, on the crops it is completely affecting their productivity then smog this we all know it's a mixture of smoke and fog so this till this we would know smog means it's a mixture of smoke and fog so how it is formed it is formed by the complex reaction between hydrocarbons and the smoke fog which is present in the presence of sunlight then it becomes a smog okay smog is another another pollutant only there are two types of smogs you can see one is classical smog and the other one is will be the photochemical smog already upsc has asked a question from photochemical smog so you should know what is smog smog means again any time it may be repeated it's because that smog is a major major problem in uh, the cities like urban cities like delhi and all you know smog is creating a lot of problems so it's a mixture of smoke and fog and classical smog if you take how it where it will occur in the cool humid temperatures in the cool humid climate this classical smog will appear and it is nothing but a mixture of the smoke the fog okay when you are writing you have to write like a formula smoke plus fog okay plus sulfur dioxide all this i don't know one one, one uh, gas also will be present okay the hydrocarbons also will be present along with the sulfur dioxide so smoke fog and sulfur dioxide when they combine they will form classical smog in a cool humid climate they will be formed so next type of smog is photochemical smog what happens they occurs in warm opposite they occurs in warm dry and sunny climate they will occur the photochemical smog so this is nothing but an outcome because uh, the unsaturated hydrocarbons along with the smoke okay fog plus fog plus you know nitrogen oxides it will react with nitrogen oxides and then it will form the photochemical smog it is very dangerous smog the photochemical smog not only causing health problem but it's also affecting the important monuments everything it's getting affected because of this photochemical smog okay so and this uh, smog is appearing in the urban areas especially you take uh, like delhi and all they are affected by photochemical smog only in the early morning you will be finding them and then the methane emissions i told you lastly so so far i have done some basic pollutants for you not all pollutants some basic pollutants what and all repeatedly upsc is asking the questions that i have done okay uh, now we will go to the methane emissions how methane is emitted because uh, you know a report very recently in 2022 a report was released that report is an ie on methane by united nation body only even ep has released this report international methane emission observatory report it was okay so this report which is talking about uh, the methane emissions how um, uh, what are the pot uh, potential sources for this methane emissions how methane is affecting the people okay uh, like that everything is discussed under this report not only this report but also you come back to the go back to 2021 where uh, the first time a report was released by com combination of two bodies one is uh, ccac that is um, you know climate and clean air coalition that is a body okay clean air coalition it's a body 
violation right and uh, this, uh, again uh, they combined they joined together with UNEP United Nation Environment Program already UPS has asked a question from climate and clean air coalition so I have not put up any details about climate and clean air coalition you can also surf and uh, just have an idea okay where uh, where uh, you know even India joined clean air coalition around 2019 okay and they are implementing a program clean air morning something like that clean air program was implemented by this clean air coalition so even India is a member of clean air coalition you can just surf down certain information related to clean air coalition here but they joined together with the UNEP and they released a report in 2021 called as global methane assessment okay and uh, it was proposed in the Glasgow conference you all would have known that UNFCC used to conduct con uh, annual conferences and uh, the co COP the conference of parties is the body which conducted the conference of parties 26th conference is held in Glasgow and the 27th one in Egypt no so the 26th conference in the 26th conference they submitted this this uh, assessment and the global methane pledge was made GMP global methane pledge was first time proposed in the uh, UNFCC meeting in Glasgow only okay then the countries which were there the participants who are there in the Glasgow conference said that we have to move ahead okay we have understood the problem you have to contribute more you have to collect more information uh, you just collect regarding the methane emissions okay uh, and uh, we have to make up already they have started to make a pledge you know they told that that is called GMP and they told that at least 30% from 2020 to 2020 levels uh, you we have to reduce by 2030 okay so this is the pledge they have made uh, methane anthropogenic methane emissions at least to reduce the global anthropogenic methane emissions at least 30% from 2020 levels by 2030 so keep this in mind so to take a voluntary action to sorry i will start from here the pledge to agree this is the pledge okay the gmp is nothing but the pledge what is gmp global methane pledge what it is saying to take voluntary action to contribute to the collective effort to reduce the global anthropogenic methane emissions at least 30 percent from 2020 levels by 2030 okay that is by 2030 they have to reduce 30 percent of the methane emission from the 2020 levels they will they have assessed you know so 2020 they know how much methane em has been emitted so from that level we have to reduce to at least 30 percent this is the pledge they have made and they asked to further uh, uh, you know uh, analyze the report and uh, the uh, body the gma's 2030 baseline report was submitted called as why acting now why you need to act now okay uh, and uh, this this report was also given by the body two bodies only UNEP and climate clean air coalition they submitted this report again to the body and uh, now they were very keen to make a new set of targets to reduce this already pledge was made to set, uh, make a new set of to bring a new set of frameworks to reduce this methane emissions okay so now they know what is the baseline emission as well as now they are trying to compare this uh, report and uh, make up uh, the pledge and uh, you know the comparing this baseline emission levels how it has to be in 2030 right and 2020 emission levels so which are communicated against the approximate baseline emission levels in 2030 against the gmp target not the gmp target previously they said this as 2020 levels uh, which is set against the 2020 emission levels okay so th that way they are trying to propose a new uh, report that is the 2030 baseline report it is called as now only the report has been submitted so so far no action has been taken but we have to know what is the methane emission which is the source of methane that much is enough we need not go, go very in, in, in depth into this okay so i just want to propose why we are doing this methane for that already from 2021 uh, the UNEP and CCAC the two bodies started analyzing uh, the emissions uh, levels of methane in the environment and what are the sources of methane how we have to reduce what are the pledges we have to make and what should be the baseline emission level whether it has to be 2020 or whether it has to be 2030 yet to be decided also let us wait and watch regarding that now we'll go to the methane how the methane is emitted what are the uh, source of methane so if you see methane uh, it's a primary component of any natural gas you take okay the production of methane uh, production of the natural gas itself will have methane only without methane there will be no natural gas you know even now we are talking about compressed biogas previously when we were preparing a biogas also biogas will have at least uh, you know 40 to 50 percent methane content will be there 
Now we in the compressed biogas, we are trying to extract this methane, remove this methane from that, and that way that's that's how we are making it. Um, you know, uh, uh, sorry, a clear gas. Anna. So uh, this primary component of natural the methane is the primary component of the natural gases and is responsible for more than 25% uh, of warming we are expecting today. Okay. So this, uh, uh, I think I have I have altered something. Sorry, I can correct it. That is in the compressed biogas. Uh, you know, the, we are trying to remove all the other pollutants except the methane. We cannot remove methane from the natural gases. Natural gas should contain this methane. Okay, there is small uh, mistake I have committed here. So you can change that. Right. So without uh, methane, we cannot have a gas. But this methane should not be exposed outside. You can use it, but you can simply try to. Uh, you know, pollute the environment. So, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, as I can say. Apart from carbon dioxide, this methane is going to pull, uh, going to create warming in the uh, atmosphere more than the carbon dioxide also. See, even the global warming potential, we call this as GWP, global warming potential. Every gases we are taking, any greenhouse gas you take, we will compare the global warming potential with carbon dioxide only. So, if you are comparing with the carbon dioxide, this uh, methane is 80 times greater than that of carbon dioxide. Okay, the 20 years if you are releasing it in the environment, then it, it is giving more harmful effect than the carbon dioxide. So, uh, around half of the tropospheric ozone, you know, we already know there is a ozone which is, uh, which is existing there in the um, stratosphere. We know that there is a ozone layer which is existing in stratosphere. But something called as tropospheric ozone is created and that is a pollutant again. So, methane is responsible for around half this very, this is very important, growth in the tropospheric zone formation, which is, uh, we call this as a potent local air by UN EPS has said this statement. These are not, see, these are not our bodies which are, which are telling about this uh, facts. These are facts which are taken by respective bodies, okay. So, uh, when I, I can say that the climate, uh, even the uh, climate warming, we are telling the Paris Agreement that we have to uh, uh, lower the limit, climate warming below 1.5 degree, you know, for that rapid action is required, we are saying, we have to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions and all, we are only talking about carbon dioxide, but we have to see the another major threat, that is methane, okay. So, methane is emitted through various sources, especially the main source for emitting this methane is, uh, you know, come to that point, agriculture. See this, agriculture is the largest emitter of methane. As you know, uh, in the cattle, one time UPC has asked this question also. Raising a livestock will give out a lot of methane gases. Agricultural crop will re release a lot of methane gases. Again, I told this product producing biogas will release methane. No, no. So, this way, methane is present everywhere in the organic matter. Especially agricultural sector will release a lot of methane. Okay. So, global methane emissions, which are responsible, uh, which is responsible for 40% of the global, you know, roughly we are saying around 40% of the global methane emissions is due to agriculture. The agriculture sector is responsible. Then comes the fossil fuel sector. This might be a question for you. Instead of asking the sources, they may say agriculture sector uh, is estimated to be, um, uh, you know, emit, uh, sorry, uh, polluting the, uh, are responsible for methane pollution for uh, roughly around 40% of the global emission levels. This way they make the statement. You have to be very clear. Yes, sure. Agriculture is the prime source for methane emission, okay? Like how we were talking about carbon dioxide, fossil fuel is the prime source. Anna, sulfur dioxide, vehicular emission is the prime source. That way, for agriculture, uh, sorry, for methane, agriculture is the prime source. Huh? And fossil fuels will be the second source. So, first agriculture, then comes fossil fuels. And that is the second largest sources, which is rep responsible for around 36% of the emission. So, he is uh, for responsible 40 and this person is uh, responsible, fellow is responsible for 36%. So, around you can see 70 to 75% is uh, responsible made by these two sectors itself. Okay. And the waste, the other waste, is waste which we are throwing outside, the sewage waste, all these will make up the rest. Okay. So, the fossil fuels are by, you know, uh, this, and, this need not we need not uh, discuss. Come to the important points. See this. This is the this is the data which was given by UNEP only. Okay, which, which is there in the clear, climate and clean uh, air coalition site only. I have taken this, and uh, they have said that. See very easily from the diagram, you can under, uh, keep it in mind. Forty-two percent emission is given by agriculture sector. Thirty-six percent through the fossil fuel emission, and uh, another eighteen percent is through waste waste which you are throwing no the waste from that. So very important this is. And others, others make up, the, others will be 3%. Uh, 
some other sources okay and uh, you know um, see this 86 times they are more powerful than a carbon dioxide over a 20 year period they are comparing in the 20 year if a carbon dioxide is present how much uh, global warming potential or uh, global warming it is going to create methane is going to create 86 times um, of, uh, more than that carbon dioxide so how much threat it is posing to us huh? so that you have to keep this in mind and another important point also i have already discussed you know that uh, tropospheric ozone this is the main precursor methane is the main precursor for the tropospheric ozone and is a powerful greenhouse gases yeah, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas okay see in health what are the problem they are creating they are creating respiratory diseases okay you cannot uh, properly breathe in and breathe out or you think the alveoli will get damaged your lungs will get damaged so this much uh, harm it is creating and also it is bringing in heart disease for the cardiovascular diseases for humans and uh, this we already know lung tissues is damaging airways is damaging and even premature death premature death it causes premature death in babies Na, premature death so this and all is resultant of methane only okay and uh, mainly not all premature death almost you know some proportion of the premature death is caused by uh, methane emission so i cannot say all the premature uh, death is happening due to uh, uh, you know methane i cannot conclude like that but but this much proportionate of a proportionate of death is caused due to methane okay and uh, you know this see this up to 15 percent uh, losses is also happening annual yield losses of wheat rice maize and soy is happening due to this methane okay not only affecting health you come to agriculture agriculture which is the source of emitter of methane is also harming the agriculture okay so it is reducing the yield of the um, crops especially the crops like the uh, staple stable uh, staple food crops like the wheat the rice the maize and the soy okay so people are also affected because of this and uh, you know the lifetime of this particular methane is around 12 years you know? so that's why we are saying 12 years is the lifetime in the atmosphere and uh, it will not last long in the atmosphere but uh, in this 12 years it will create a major damage to all the sectors which we have discussed now including humans okay so this be expected this year that's why i've done a brief discussion uh, sorry elaborate discussion on it of that topic now come to the another important pollutant which was present in the water drinking water one time upsc has asked this question what are the pollutants which are found in drinking water in india they gave some five six pollutant uh, below and they asked you to pick up choose the right answer okay choose the right option okay they gave one two and three only one four and five only this way they gave the option and asked you to select the right option so if you see this the central water commission has already long back around 2015 itself least what are that um, uh, important pollutants which are present in rivers which are present in our, any other water bodies fresh water bodies and which are there in the tap water anna? so that way they have came up with lot of data in that they told that not only the pollutants like uh, uh, you know the hydrocarbons all these are present but uh, you can also see the heavy metal pollution is also there heavy metals which is present in water and we are drink, drinking it like lead you are you know you are, we are talking about the two minutes noodle we are saying that they are having lead in their uh, product but everyday water which is very much important and essential for our survival is also loaded with lead arsenic okay uh, cadmium one said mercury one said imagine mercury and all huh? so this way the toxic chemicals are present which is also having a carcinogenic effect cancer causing agents we call them so this way they are present in the waters uh, water of uh, the drinking water okay and beyond the level which is prescribed by icmr that is indian council of medical research has said okay this much level is tolerable in the body but above that it is very dangerous to the health and uh, it, it causes potential health risk to the so that way it is present now come to this important uh, non-eel phenol okay this was one chemical sorry this was one pollutant which was present in drinking water they may not ask the same question again like what are the pollutants which are present in the drinking water but may, they, they may take this term called non-eel phenol and give certain skills related to non-eel phenol so this was in the news last one year like they were discussing about non-eel phenol presence in uh, throughout the uh, drinking water bodies in our country 
So you, if you see, this is a very toxic chemical. They are saying like a phenolic compound. It's a phenolic compound, okay? And this is used, uh, this can be a question like this. It is used as a formulant in pesticide and lubricating oil also, okay? So this non phenol is used in uh, formulant in pesticide industries and lubricating oil additive. And uh, what happened? The drinking water samples across India, if you take, they can, uh, had uh, this non phenol in them, okay? This non phenol is going to completely damage your endocrine system. Imagine your endocrine system is gone. Body functions is totally disrupted. Reproductive system is disrupted. Immune system is gone. Endocrine itself gone. Then everything is gone only in humans. And this is going to impact the aquatic life also and the wildlife also. Humans itself gone. Then aquatic life, wildlife, everything. Everything will be affected because of this non phenol. And this chemical, uh, this and all, this, some data, this we need not discuss. But... Uh, this non phenol, uh, I already told, it's used as a formulant in the pesticide industry and oil additives also. And they are used in the production of non phenol ethoxylate, NPE. In the, they may ask this term also. non phenol ethoxylates will give out non phenol pollutant. The statement can be like this. So, you have to be very careful. So, they are used in the production of non phenol ethoxylates. And this non phenol ethoxylates is used in variety of consumer, uh, consumer products. Every day you are using, no, in that they are using this L-phenol ethoxylates. What and all, you are cleaning your home and you are cleaning your clothes. So, for that you are using certain products huh? such as detergents you are using and even the wetting agents, dispersants, even it is used as a surfactant. This NP is no, non l ethoxylates is used in these places. They are used for this and when NPE enter into the environment, it breaks down to non phenol. It breaks down to non phenol. Okay, so non phenol is present in uh, non non phenol ethoxylate, and non phenol ethoxylate is present in the detergent, and it is used as a surfactant. It is used as dispersants, and when it enters into the water bodies or when it enters into any other soil any anywhere, it breaks down to non phenol, and through that it uh, enters into the groundwater, and it is contaminating the water. Okay, so now uh, apart from the standard, you know, already the one main problem is that the BAS, the Bureau of Indian Standards are the one who will set the standards for the phenolic compound in the drinking water and all. They will do it. And uh, uh, they have said that, see, uh, one part per billion and surface water, the 15 parts per million. But for non -il phenol, phenolic compounds, they would set. non -il phenol is very new. For that, no specific standard has been made so far uh, by BAS. But UNEP has declared it as a chemical of global concern. So, no standards, have, they may give that BAS has set a standard for non phenol. BAS has not set a standard for non phenol, set standards for only the phenolic compounds. Okay, you have to be very careful while you are doing that. Right. Now, uh, marine pollution, come to marine pollution. Not all pollution will be touched by us. Uh, water pollution, we are not doing it because we know that the organic waste, the other chemical pollutant, the sea, dumping of sewage, Dumping of industrial effluents will create a uh, water pollution. But uh, in the drinking water, a pollutant called non phenol, which came in the news, we discussed now. We already discussed about certain gaseous pollutant. Anna, what are the pollutants which are uh, polluting the air? Now we are going to marine pollution. See this oil spills, a major havoc. Anna, uh, already we know that coral reef is dying. Coral bleaching has occurred in Australia. And there is a connective event. One major threat for this is also oil spill only. See, in this figure itself, a turtle uh, is carrying a plastic bag in his mouth. He's thinking it's something to eat and it's carrying that. So, this way only, the marine organisms and all is, is killed, get killed by the plastic waste which is floating over the sea as marine snow. And now, we'll come to the oil spill. That area first we'll complete, then we'll go to the plastic waste. See, oil spill is mainly due to um, the... Various even, various the ships which just keep on traveling, it's spilling the oil outside. So, this is something called as an aromatic hydrocarbon, no? which is present in the oil. We call that a type of hydrocarbon, aromatic hydrocarbon only. And this is causing a serious threat to the marine organisms, so, sometimes immediately killing them or causing a, a long term effect in their bodies. So, what happens? This they will this will accumulate in the food chain. This oil which is consumed by this organism will accumulate in the food chain. We call this as bioaccumulation. Do you remember this term? So, here only you will be coming across a term called as bioaccumulation and bio um, mag sorry, magnification. Accumulation is something where the pollutant enter into the food chain. 
suppose at, uh, uh, let us see a coral is there okay a coral is there now uh, the oil is floating and coming to the coral. coral coral absorbs it now it is in its body it is called bioaccumulation how this oil enters in food chain now coral is consumed by another organism let us take some starfish or something which is going to consume this coral okay or even you can e take an easy example where a fish fish is uh, swimming and now the oil gets inside the fish fish is, fish is eaten by a turtle okay, now the the oil is uh, uh, going from the fish to the turtle Anna? so that is called as bio magnification because that uh, it cannot be digested by the uh, um, organs of that wild animal so it keeps on accumulating it that is called as bio magnification uh, and which passes from one level to another like a food chain which passes from one level to another. this chemical also will pass because it is not getting digested a lot of chemicals is like that including this hydrocarbons you can say and not only this immediately killing another effect is this bio magnification and bio accumulation and another important problem is this oil no this is coating the feathers of marine birds okay especially the one diving birds you would have seen no? they dive they catch the fish go so when the oil is coated over their feathers and even the seals seal no seal which you are seeing in the water ocean near the water bodies this oil is completely disrupting their uh, natural insulation body heat no they are insulating no so that are completely destroyed and they, it also affect damage the buoyancy which makes the uh, animal to float you know? so it is completely destroyed and because of this they get drowned or die okay because of the loss of body heat since the oil is not allow, making him to insulate the body heat, the body heat is lost and the animal is dead. Slowly you are killing him. So this is one important pollution we can say. Same way micro beads and plastic pollution. Face to fish we are saying. You are washing your face with the um, uh, what and all you face wash or something. And you are using some makeups in your faces. You are washing it away again. There are some micro beads which is present. Okay. So these are something a small plastic pollutant which enter which goes into the body of my uh, uh, marine organisms accumulate in his body okay so this this is again posing serious risk to the marine organisms okay see need to not only clog the digestive system of that animal but also it is considered as very harmful for the marine ecosystems completely any any ecosystem in the marine area you take is completely harming that okay and then uh, now we'll go to the next one see this e waste so we have come to the in the waste we have come to the last one that is e-waste what are those called as e-waste all the items of electrical and electronics equipment okay which has been discarded by the humans that i don't want i uh, he, uh, i doesn't want this uh, mobile phone i'm going to discard it i doesn't want this laptop it is too old i'm going to buy a new one discarding it so without uh, making without trying to reuse it are trying to circulate you know sarcanami how well it is not functioning it's very fun uh, poor in case of e-waste although it is functioning it is in the informal sector only the de developed countries doesn't want to do this because there are a lot of uh, serious chemicals which is uh, leaking out or seeping out from this e-waste in the form of uh, the life-threatening metal pollutions okay which the developed countries doesn't want to do it so if they are dumping their waste over the developing country and in the developing country there is no proper sector to take care of this the informal sector enters into this and then the small children without wearing proper safety gears are touching this and try, try trying to extract the metals like gold huh? from this um, phones or from the laptops or from any electronic devices you take okay so we have given these are some of the electronic devices starting from the notebooks tablets mobile phones every, everything okay so washing machines to cloth dryers to mesh, uh, children's toys is having this products and they are releasing hazardous chemicals like you know mercury lead nickel cadmium chromium pcbs and pbbs that is polybrominated biphenyls and all these like flame uh, you know even brominated flame flame retardant all these are released from this electrical and electronic goods especially from the in it related devices this was a question you know long back i told you what are the pollutants which are released from a e-waste that was one question they asked that especially in the information related equipment information technology related equipment like computer you take mouse you take monitor you take, keyboard you take what are those which are released out so they said they gave an option like they mentioned some few words from here they have taken and they have mentioned it in the option and asked you to choose the right answer what are the pollutants which are released from e-waste 
again they may may repeat or may not repeat because already in my exercise also i have told you some questions get repeated by changing the format some even not changing the format only options change and they give the repeated so be careful while doing it so now all the heavy subjects are heavy met like uh, start from lead to mercury to cadmium to beryllium is present here and uh, this is very harmful to the health okay it's completely affecting the health so we have to the end of the pollutant see the last pollutant which we have to see is dioxin only this also was in news recently why because you know that there was a recently a survey was conducted uh, related to this dioxin uh, and they said like how much uh, this dioxin is absorbed in the human's body that way they try to make a survey okay so in that if you see the dioxins are nothing but it's a chemical which is uh, called as persistent organic pollutant pops we call them shortly as pops okay and we all know that there is a separate convention to regulate the pops ana uh, to re reduce to stop the persistent organic pollutant in the atmosphere that is called as stockholm convention we have already have that as a convention india is also signatory to it but more they have now recently released a report that dioxin uh, contamination is seen in human body it has been accumulated for longer years till even 11 years it will remain in the chemi the chemical the sorry the pollutant will remain in the human's body so mainly what is the source of dioxin how the humans are exposed to dioxin 90% if you see the human exposure is through food only what you are consuming meat you are consuming dairy products you are taking fishes shellfishes you are getting dioxin so this is the main source for the dioxin right and this is highly toxic pollutant and it can completely affect the reproductive and the developmental problems in the humans and damage the immune system also so even the hormone damage and all is happening because of this dioxin only this way they released a report okay and then see this they may stay in the body for 7 to 11 years okay because they accumulate in the fat tissues where they are stored in the body and now uh, um, the next important thing see then there may be a, there may be a point that india has banned the dioxin india has not banned the dioxin even there are 12 pops which are which should be banned under the stockholm convention but what india did india has the ministry of environment has only accepted the seven, uh, you know 7 pops to be banned here and that names and all is given here so not dioxin is included in it so it is posing a severe threat to people we have to be very careful related to that okay now uh, this is another um, substance also you can note this per and polyfluoroalkyl two alkyl substances okay where and all so this this how may ask they may give pfas last year they asked a question pet bottles pet bottles you no know, related to that they gave certain statements they asked which of the above is correct see most of the questions will be from this section only that's why we have kept it in a larger way and in the middle we will be doing something as fast as could and then conservation measures will go so pfas are all using it's a group of chemicals which are used to make um, the coatings you know the fluor uh, fluoropolymer coating and also in the products which is just trying to resist heat no you are taking a pan in that pfa coating is there ha huh? non stick tawas and all to resist heat oil stains grease we are using this coating and uh, uh, this coating is used in very very of uh, the kitchen products imagine and even in cloth okay even in furniture we are having that even in food packing also they are using this substance and that's why this this pfas has entered into our life okay and even in electric wire insulation also we are using that okay and then see this pfas are found in rivers and lakes and in many types of animals also now we are uh, seeing this because it is also having the capability of bio accumulation and bio magnification in this way it is entering into the Uh, body of humans also. Now we will go to the convention conservation measures. So far we have discussed various types of pollutants are not conservation measures. Before that we have to see the other uh, uh, issues, environmental issues. So first one we will talk about climate change. What is climate change? What is causing a climate? That although there are natural events which are causing a climate change, you no know, natural events like uh, the rotation of earth these are trying to bring in changes of the climate that naturally has sorry but due uh, humans due to their own anthropogenic activity is creating is creating a artificial change in climate and that we call as climate change that only we will call as climate change 
and uh, there is a connection for climate change which is called as greenhouse gases okay greenhouse gases is a major impact a major uh, influencer of a climate change and how they are going to change the climate or uh, how they are going to warm the air that only we are going to see we all would have known about uh, the greenhouses you know when you are visiting some places they will have a greenhouse glass house we say In what process they have made that glass house the same process how the earth is functioning coming short wave solar radiation okay when the income that is called greenhouse effect one time upsc long back has asked this greenhouse effect so when this now uh, very recently they asked about some other pro, um, process called as greenhouse protocol that is totally different so when this greenhouse has enter uh, sorry when this incoming short wave solar radiation enters the earth already before entering the earth the uh, clouds uh, in the atmosphere will reflect some okay the gases which is present will reflect some then uh, some are uh, the, the gases which are present will reflect some the clouds will absorb some and some are reaching the earth and when after in the earth it is reflected back in the form of long ir radiation okay infrared radiation you all know that i hope the geography you have definitely studied in our ir radiation it is reflected back this ir radiation cannot fully escape the earth if it escapes then what the earth will be cold earth is very cold so in not to es make is it escape the gases which are present above will also some of this ir radiation what gases will absorb this ir radiation the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide okay all will be present in the atmosphere and they absorb this naturally we all know our atmosphere itself is made of 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen percent is made of trace gases that 1% that is trace gas like neon carbon dioxide argon and uh, helium like this we have lot of mixture of gases but all these gases are playing a major role really the climate of the environment but what happens they are observing this uh, natural process is that they have to observe this ir radiation and keep the earth warm otherwise humans cannot wait. but what happens here since this gases are increasing at an enormous level trapping in more heat than what they have to trap and uh, so storing more heat what they have to store and this is keeping the earth warmer and uh, doesn't mean that you know it's warm okay put an ac switch on an ac and we all can live in an ac no no such thing could happen because this warming is going to completely affect the entire climate of the earth okay and even uh, many organisms has went extinct because of this increasing surface temperature and lot of um, uh, you know marine organisms have already lost their Uh, uh life because they cannot survive they cannot adapt immediately to the increasing temperatures even the species are also affected humans are also affected sea level is keep on increasing because there is continuously melting of snow and ice and arctic ice is keep on melting and the thickness is completely reducing now the sea levels are raising when sea levels are raising even our neighboring country like bangladesh is going to go inside the sea one day and uh, because there uh, there are so many parts of that uh, country that is barely above one uh, you know uh, above one meter above the uh, sea level so what happens if sea rises immediately they will go inside so this way that this is uh, causing a lot of problems and there is interconnectivity all see this the primary green gases can be considered as carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide ozone fluorinated gases like chlorofluorocarbon hydrofluorocarbon ferrofluor we call them them as ferrous sulfur has sulfur hexafluoride uh, nitrogen trifluoride all these will give green effect okay and apart from the, this and the nitric oxide carbon oxide they will react with the green gases and they will also increase their concentration in atmosphere so this way there is continuously a reaction chemical reaction is going on in the atmosphere due to the increase of this man made release of gases okay and now uh, what the effect this global warming is creating i already told is rising in sea level changing in climate patterns and even affecting the hydrological cycles uh, you know the places where there are uh, um, uh, drought is prevailing more drought more dry conditions and people are completely starving to death and some because they are dependent on rain then com completely the climate pattern has changed and there is no rain for them okay rain fed crops no agriculture people are moving to urban areas and working as slaves okay we are working in informal sectors once farmers now working as a security guard in an informal sector so this way it is changing the life of people and it's also responsible for spreading of diseases now we will go to the important issue called ocean depletion or ozone hole how it is created uh, before some 3 4 years i they asked a question that what are the major pollutants which are causing acid rain 
there was one question like that okay any time you, you they may there might be a question which is related to another uh, problem like ozone depletion they can ask or ocean acidification they can ask what are the major pollutants which are causing ocean acidification so you have to be careful you all know that in the, the ozone is present in the stratosphere anna? and uh, this is protecting us or shielding us from the harmful ultraviolet radiation uh, which is present in the uh, which is coming from the above like you v radiations a b c and all we have in uv and uh, b and c is very harmful i think so they are protecting it otherwise we are exposed to them directly and it causes skin cancer also so what is happen how it is happening already you know that you uh, that ozone itself is a product which was created due to uv uv radiation if it comes and uh, when it falls on that stratosphere layer it will damage the oxygen molecules which is present there uh, so it will it will uh, you know um, uh, bifurcate the oxygen molecule and produce the molecular oxygen will be split into free oxygen atoms o o atoms two o atoms will be produced now this uh, free radicals the free atoms which are floating there will go and combine with the oxygen atom the molecular oxygen and turn to o3 because ozone formula is o3 it will form o3 you know so o2 it, it, it is which is um, splitted up due to the uv radiation into o plus o molecules this o will combine with the another o2 which is present in the atmosphere and will form o3 okay this way this reaction will continuously keep on happening and that's how the ozone is uh, made and this is this ozone is heavily unstable we already know know that no it's completely unstable but it repeatedly creates that and ozone layer is formed but what happens we are releasing the chlorofluorocarbons huh? uh, so when these ferrons are pushed into the atmosphere i already told that they go and stay in the uh, stratosphere and there is no vertical movement of also so it stays for longer period at the same time. and uh, like how the ozone is created by reaction with the uv radiation same way the cfcs will go and react there and uh, uh, will form a chlorinated compounds this chlorine will then disrupt the uh, ozone uh, molecule o3 molecule will damage the o3 molecule will take the oxygen o from that uh, o molecule and now it converts into molecular oxygen so ozone is continuously uh, depleted and that create that a hole is created called as ozone hole okay so when all already we have seen the source of pollutant of cfcs and this is called as the ozone hole or ozone depletion so what are the substances which will create that ozone depletion i have given here if any question they are asking so these are the major substances which are causing ozone depletion like chlorofluorocarbon hcfcs hydrochlorofluorocarbon hydrobromofluorocarbon halons methyl bromide carbon tetrachloride methyl chloroform all these are some of the compounds which are going to create it okay so this way uh, we'll move to the effect of this ozone depletion what are the effect we are going to face like uh, aging of skin cataract sunburn skin cancers like this we can see even affecting the productivity in plants okay and even damaging the other animals also phytoplankton is also getting damaged okay and uh, even it increases the evaporation of surface water see this evaporation of surface water through the stomata of the leaves and it decreases the moisture content of the soil that is also the effect of uv evaporation is increasing on side and moisture is decreased okay it is also damaging the paints and fibers and causing fade these are some of the effect of uh, ocean depletion and then come to acid deposition acids we all know acid no acid rain it comes in the form of precipitation uh, in the form of there is a wet precipitation or wet deposition we call it as a wet de deposition in the form of rain or in the form of snow or even in the form of fog it will come down dry deposition means it will be present in the air and it is deposited over the buildings or plants or anywhere it is deposited and again when rain comes it comes down uh, and re reaches the soil so how this acids and all is created as you can see uh, that when the ph level when what we call as acid rain when the rain then the rain's ph level is should be less than 5.6 then we call that as acid rain and this is mainly due to the sulfuric uh, the presence of sulfuric or nitric acid only that means the two compounds which is responsible for acid rain you can see this this figure from the figure you can easily understand acid rain is sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxide compounds they are responsible who is responsible for emitting sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide industrial emissions vehicular emissions all these are responsible for emitting sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide now they reaches the cloud in the form of precipitation then they come out uh, as uh, you know the rain see these are wet wet deposition 
acid fog this i have taken from ncert only you can also refer that acid fog acid rain acid snow anyway in the form of wet deposition they comes out a sulfuric acid and nitric acid the sulfur dioxide and nitrogen ox dioxide will react uh, with the gases present in the water vapor and they will come down as sulfuric acid and uh, nitric acid that they get diluted form is acid form and they come down as acid and affecting the aquatic lives also affecting the plant life affecting the humans everything and dry deposition is mainly causing major havoc to the vegetation only when where they go and up over the trees and uh, completely affecting the uh, vegetation okay so this way we have to know about the uh, acid deposition and this is simply talking about the acid rain so they may nothing you have to know such as sulfur and nitrogen oxides especially for dioxide nitrogen oxide after oxidation and reaction with the water form of water vapor no it is present and it converts diluted form of sulfuric or nitric acid and it is causing harm to in every life see this some of the effect of acid rain in the vegetation it is trying to uh, affect the soil fertility and uh, affecting the plant growth completely it affects the plant growth even the soil microorganisms are affected because of like soil microorganisms means of fungi bacteria which are present there and which are very useful for nutrient cling are affected due to this acid rain okay even the human health is affected he is observing he is uh, <laughs> inhaling the air which is considering consisting of this uh, compounds and his respiratory system is also damaged lung is damaged heart is damaged respiratory problems he gets okay this way he is affected even water bodies and aquatic life also the acid the acid rain it reaches the water and it uh, changes the nature of water also water water ph value is also changed and because of this ocean acidification or water acidification takes place and this is even causing the death of uh, the marine organisms okay even the not only the calcifying organisms that is one which forms the shell but one which does not form the is also affected non calcifying organisms are also affected because of this I mean, and even not only the animals the living things are affected but the dam in the buildings are also damaged due to acid rain acid rain damages the bridges any any types of monuments you take any statues you take it is completely corroded because especially the limestone related uh, construction and all is totally affected because of acid rain and also co corrode not only the limestone but also metals and also it uh, completely affect the paint paint and all no when you are painting and uh, that is completed Uh, acid rain and all exposure to acid rain it is completely peeling off and ocean acidification this is a last issue which we have to touch so ocean acidification already we have discussed a bit but if you see ocean is a major carbon sink we know that no major sink of carbon is a major carbon sink so when carbon that is in the form of carbon dioxide is taken uh, absorbed into the water now what happen already we know the ocean water is basic in nature if the ph value is above 7 it is basic ana right? so below 7 it is acidic so the ph value of ocean water is around 8.1 so it's basic only and when this carbon dioxide usually ocean used to absorb the carbon dioxide but now it is absorbing more and more carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide levels are increasing in the atmosphere so once when this carbon dioxide dissolves in the water it will react to the water molecules how the nitrogen and the sulfur nitrogen oxides nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide when they react with the water vapor they dilute they sorry they change to a diluted form of sulfuric acid and nitric acid we saw no in acid rain same way here when once when carbon dioxide get dissolves in the ocean water they will react with the water molecules to form a weak acid called as carbonic acid it gets diluted in the form of weak acid called carbonic acid so there are, there are there will be another compounds this weak acid will not stable will not be stable will again uh, it will uh, you know transform into two ions okay so a carbon dioxide exist in four different forms inside the ocean water one is in the form of dissolved carbon dioxide another the dissolved carbon dioxide will react with the water molecule and form carbonic acid and this carbonic acid will split into two ions that is one is bicarbonate ions and another is carbonate ions this carbonate ions is very much important for the formation of shell because calcium carbonate the shells of many, many, most of the marine organisms especially who belongs to arthropoda families and all they have shell over the body okay so this shell has to be formed by uh, extracting calcium carbonate from the ocean water and for that carbonate ions is very important but what happens here once lot of carbon dioxide is absorbed inside this carbonate ion will not stay as carbonate ion it will go back and react with carbonic acid 
to form bicarbonate ions. See this. Now there is imbalance. This 4 has to be in balance in the ocean water in order to maintain its pH value as 8.1. Now what happens? Since more carbon dioxide is absorbed, they dissolve. The carbon dioxide gets converted into uh, carbonic acid. Once when it gets converted to carbonic acid, the carbonate ions which is present in the water will go react with carbonic acid and make bicarbonate ion. So now there is no carbonate ions, uh, sufficient carbonate ions available for the marine organisms. Okay, this way it is going to completely affect the, uh, the acidity level also increases, ocean acidity level also increases and it is also going to uh, leave uh, with less carbon, less availability of carbonate ions also will be there in the ocean water, thereby affecting the uh, marine organisms, the shell forming marine organisms. So, there are two problems, two interrelated problems due to ocean acidification. One, increasing acidity level. Second, less availability of carbonate ion for the formation of shells. So, what and all effect we are going to face due to ocean acidification? It is very dangerous to the shell builders. Completely is going to affect the shell forming animals it is going to affect like as we have already said some animals used to extract this shim uh, carbonate and then they construct their shell like corals you take like oysters you take uh, crabs you take lobster okay so uh, not only this much more organisms are there like this and they are trying to build their shell they build their skeletons using this calcium carbonate only okay even you take a sea um, you know uh, lily or uh, something like that where the chitin which is formed of calcium carbonate the shells uh, no, the, the which is formed the chitin layer which is formed of calcium carbonate. so here completely the body, uh, animal is not able to survive since they don't get calcium for the formation of their exoskeletons so if the ph of the ocean also gets too low what happens there is another uh, effect is, is also faced because of this. Not only they are able to extract the calcium carbonate from the water and form a shell, the already formed shell will start to dissolve, will begin to dissolve because the ocean water is changing its character. So now it's completely affecting the marine organisms and these types of marine organisms will disappear, will vanish. So again, see this is another um, algae called as coralline algae where this algae used to use the highest form of calcium uh, calcite form, highest calcite form in the form of magnesium calcite. It's the highest form of calcium carbonate. The magnesium calcite which they use to build the shells. So uh, what happens? This, this is more soluble than the uh, regu regu regulate calcite and then uh, it puts this people at danger. You know, when the water turns acidic, they will, the shell will completely, the uh, of the algae, algae will completely uh, uh, destroy, okay, and then it is to affect that type of algae. And also, non-calcifying animals are also getting affected because of this ocean acidification. Here, we have given a lot of examples for that. So, and one important thing, you can notice dimethyl sulfide. The production of dimethyl sulfide is very important, which creates an impact on the precipitation factor. Cloud formation, it is important in cloud formation. This dimethyl sulfate will be released out by the marine organisms only. So, once already this ocean acidification is at one side, okay, and carbon dioxide is completely absorbed, absorbed, absorbed inside, and the acidity level is also increasing and is also affecting the formation of uh, shells also in the marine organisms. And what happened? The DMS release, release of DMS has been reduced, which is done. The DMS, once it is released by the marine organisms, now the reduction. There is a reduction in the production of DMS and because of this, the precipitation formation is also affected. This was given as one point in UPSC. In one question, they asked this point. When the article related to this DMS came out, they asked, they put this as a uh, inside that uh, question. Now, about Stockholm Convention. Now, we are going to international conventions which are available for, uh, you know, uh, fight against these types of pollution and pollution loads. So, first... Uh, this is basic convention and it's celebrating year-wise classification. It is uh, having a very important place. So, that's why I put up Stockholm Convention here. So, it's a legally binding international agreement only. It's a legally binding agreement. What are the points you have to look for? I'll be underlying that. It's a legally binding international agreement and this Stockholm Convention is mainly for what? We, uh, we brought this Stockholm Convention on persistent organic pollutants. Okay. So, the main objective of this convention is to protect the human health and the environment from the POPs, that is persistent organic pollutant. So, what are POPs? The POPs are the one which can stay longer time in the environment and travel the distances in the uh, environment also. So, they are called, that is why they are called as persistent organic pollutant. So, exposure to this will cause lot of problems starting from reproductive disorders. 
to immune system damage, hormonal damage, everything will be damaged, even cancers will be created when you are exposed to POPs. So, the Stockholm Convention is not uh, trying to eradicate all the POPs at one go, but they did the very dangerous POP, which is already existing, which was created by humans only. We will start with that 12 worst POP and then we will move to the next level, they said. So, uh, in that 12 POPs, which has been uh, released, which has been given out by the Stockholm Convention, India has selected 7 to go now and later they will be adding more. So, now at present 150 for, uh, 152 countries have ratified this convention and uh, see sorry, one, more, after 152 countries ratified, it has become entered into force around 2004, okay. This convention entered into force around 2004 and uh, you know, India has ratified this convention around 2006. Okay, so the year is not important, but India has ratified this convention and India has ratified under one condition that is called as opt-out position. See this opt-out position, that means what? So they will say India has agreed completely to the uh, Stockholm Convention. The point may be like this, it's not uh, true. India has, has special provision called the opt-out position such that if there is any amendment in the annex, because in this convention there is a lot of annex which is given, annex 1, annex 2 like this, annexes will be there. So, if there, if there is any change in the annex of the convention, it cannot be directly enforced or it will not come directly in force on India. India has to submit the instrument of ratification by accepting the ratification which is done in the access. It has to submit. I have agreed to the change. In that way, when the approval is uh, submitted, with the depository, then only it will be applicable over India. It is not automatically uh, come into force over India, okay. So, that way India has opted out for opt-out position, right. Now, the Ministry of Environment and Forest is responsible for uh, allotting or, uh, you know, uh, assigning certain chemicals the, under the POPs, 12 POPs, they will choose, uh, they have chosen the 7 POPs and they are the nodal agency for doing it. So, these are the seven uh, POPs which has been banned in India and that when I am discussing dioxin, I told that dioxin is not one of them. Okay. So, and ab ab apart from this, you can see the Global Environment Facility is the designated uh, financial mechanism for the Stockholm Convention. Okay. So, see the seven uh, chemicals which are listed under uh, Stockholm Convention on PO POPs only is accepted by India. Okay. And uh, the Cabinet has further de delegated power to ratify the chemicals uh, under the Stockholm Convention to both the ministries, Ministry of External Affairs as well as the Ministry of Environment and Forest, okay. So, this you have to remember certain facts which I have already underlined for you. And uh, this way, they will ask where this has been uh, notified. You know, we have notified that we have to remove the persistent organic pollutant, which under which act it has been notified. Then you have to know under the provisions of Environment Protection Act 1986, we have uh, notified that, that this seven pollutants has to be removed. So, under this act only we have placed this, okay. So, these are some of the important points which you have to take care uh, related to Stockholm Convention. Same way the Rotterdam Convention, the Rotterdam Convention, uh, when Stockholm convention, uh, convention is talking about persistent organic pollutant, the Rotterdam Convention is talking about the uh, hazardous chemicals, movement of hazardous chemical. So, they, they are not stopping the movement of hazardous chemical, but they are regulating it. How they are regulating it? By sharing of information. That is prior informed consent, we say that. We are trying to inform the import country that this chemical is having this type of character. It may cause this type of damage. So, this way you have to provide with proper information, okay. So, that's the obligation. That's the duty of every country to do it. And uh, this is also multilateral legally binding agreement only, which, which is pre prescribing uh, the obligation on the <coughs> importers and exporters of certain hazardous chemicals, okay. The one which is going to send and one which is going to import. So, this is full, the na full name of this convention itself is called Rotterdam Convention on the Prior Informed Consent Procedure for Certain Hazardous Chemicals and Pesticide in International Trade. This is a full name, okay. You are going to trade a chemical, provide the information of that chemical. That's what Rotterdam Convention is saying. Okay, and uh, why? Because parties has to, parties have every right to know about uh, the chemical which they are importing into their country. Okay, so this came, this was adopted, this convention was adopted around 1998 and it entered into force around 2004, long after 1998 it was adopted and 2004 it entered into uh, force and India has uh, acceded to this convention, that is India has ratified the convention around 2006. 
and see the much more point, important points under this is that one you have to keep in mind that is not banning any chemical hazardous chemical is trying to provide information related to that chemical it's also legal agreement only but prior informed consent is very important related to the import and export of chemical that only it is trying to do so the objective is to promote the shared responsibility and the co co cooperative effort among the parties you know one which is trying to export and one which is trying to import they should have that uh, effort uh, in the international trade of certain hazardous chemical in order to protect the human health okay and the environment so what and all damage it is going to cause that way you have to know about it and uh, to contribute to the environment is sound use of those chemicals by facilitating the information exchange about the character for a national decision making process you require that okay and um, it applies to the industrial chemical. What are the chemicals it will apply? They will say. They will ask some point like that. Hazardous chemical means what are the chemicals it is going to get applied. It applies to industrial chemicals as well as the pesticides. Okay. Not only industrial chemicals. They may give a statement like this. The Rotterdam Convention uh, which is governing the movement of hazardous uh, chemicals will apply to only industrial chemicals or applies to industrial chemicals only. They will give like this. Not only industrial chemicals but also pesticides. So now it is an agreement we already told. So it's creating a legally binding obligation for uh, implementation of this PIC, prior informed consent is very important. This is a procedure to be followed. Okay. So they, the PIC does not ban any chemical, does not restrict the movement of any chemical. But what it does, it try to provide information about that chemical. And it will try to obtain the information and disseminate that information to the uh, parties which are importing, which are exporting it. So that uh, same way, see this, if the chemical is listed in Annex 3 of the convention and for ensuring the compliance with these, uh, with these decisions by the exporting party, chemicals are subject to the PIC procedure if they are included in the Annex 3. You have to inform about the chemical. Okay. So, once it is included in Annex 3, uh, what they will do? A decision guidance doc, they will provide this DGD. DGD is nothing but a decision guidance document. So, all the information related to that chemical will be there and uh, whether the country has to decide whether I am going to import it or not. Whether I can uh, just stop it or ban it or restrict this chemical because this is going to cause this much uh, harm to my people if I import it inside my country. This way they will make a decision. So you are giving information only that is called as decision guidance document DGD. Okay, under the PAP procedure we used to do this. Sorry, PAC procedure we used to do that. See, another important convention which I want to discuss is there are a lot of conventions, but uh, only few we are going to discuss here. That is Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol, if you see, this, this, is a sub, this is a protocol. It's a protocol which is talking about the ocean depleting substances. Okay. The, the substance which are going to deplete the ocean air. And regarding that, what this protocol is saying? How to control the production and consumption of certain chemicals. Uh, like CFCs because these are the ones which, which are going to uh, deplete the ozone, no, CFCs, halons, and then uh, HCFC, methyl bromide and similar chemicals, okay. So, it was signed around 1987 and it took effect around 1989 immediately and this is a one and only UN treaty which has been ratified by every country, okay. So, Montreal Protocol which is talking about the ocean depleting substances and uh, India, Every country has ratified, India has also ratified this agreement and uh, this protocol has uh, faced around 5 amendments so far. So far, the last amendment was made around 2016 and all. So, every time they will set a target level, okay, how much level we have to reduce the production of these and alternate, uh, uh, alternate chemical which can be uh, substituted for the CFCs. This way they are trying to uh, talk, trying to make a um, decision, okay. So, one thing you have to put in mind is Montreal is talking about the ocean depleting substances. Then come to the Kyoto Protocol. Kyoto Protocol is talking about the greenhouse, how to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. This is, uh, this is proposed in the Kyoto Protocol. And it was also adopted around 1997, okay. And it entered into force around 2005, very later, okay. And now there are around 192 parties for this Kyoto Protocol. And we know India has also has signed this Kyoto and uh, mainly it is talking about the greenhouse to reduce, to limit and reduce the greenhouse gas emission. The aim is to limit and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions uh, and every country can make their individual targets for doing it. Okay. So, see this. 
here under this Kyoto protocol only the, pro the pro protocol itself is functioning under common but differentiated responsibility and respective capability because you say that every country has to reduce to this level and uh, this much reduction has to be done uh, the base level you have to keep at as 2005 or 2010 but uh, country has to have the finance mechanism to support it so how immediately stop the greenhouse gases emission from the industries from the vehicles they cannot immediately adopt to solar mechanisms and uh, the ethanol is very costly so now that's why they are saying that okay fine we will uh, we will give that uh, to the countries itself. they can come uh, with a differentiated responsibility but everyone has to reduce a, has to have a common aim that to re, that is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that is why this uh, principle was first proposed under this and even Kyoto has two annexes. One annexes is talking about all the greenhouse gases. You know, it lists out all the greenhouse gases like this. You can see annex A, listing out all greenhouse gases. Annex B is talking about the limitation or reduction commitment. Which commitment can be done and the targets, setting of targets for the industrial industrialized countries. That is one which is completely industrialized and the economies which is in transition like this, they are setting up the targets. Okay. So, under this protocol only, there are three mechanisms. One is the international emission trading mechanism. We call this as carbon trade. See this international emission trading mechanism. Already UPSS for it asked several questions from this protocol. Even they used to give the protocol sanction at one side and you asked to match you, match the following. Huh? So, related uh, statement will be given on the other side also. So, under this Kyoto protocol, if you see emission trading mechanism, this is called as carbon trade. Like other product which is traded in the market, carbon is traded. The countries, every country will be allotted certain uh, carbon and a level which they can use, which they can emit out, emission. This much a carbon emission can be done. But if they exceed their level, what they will do, they will go to countries where they, they are having uh, excess uh, emission level. That is, uh, they, they will never emit that much level. Uh, so, below the target only they would have emitted. There will be a lot of carbon uh, stock, carbon uh, emission will be remaining with them. They will buy, borrow it from them. That is buying from them and use it for their own emissions. To compensate it, they will pay something for them. Anna? So, this is how they are trading. Carbon is traded like any other commodity now. And uh, next is car clean development mechanism. It is also a mechanism which is talking under this protocol. It allows a country with an emission reduction or emission limitation commitment under the Kyoto protocol and to implement that is annex B party we call them to implement an emission reduction project that is the country which has to reduce its uh, reduce its carbon dioxide level that is called as annex B party they have to start a project called as emission reject, rejection project and that comes under CDM okay and then comes the see the, and that project when they are starting a project like em, reducing emission and all that will be given CER credit or CER certificate will be issued for that project. See, we call that as certified emission reduction credits, okay, that will be granted for that project and it is equivalent to 1 ton of carbon dioxide, that way they will calculate and, uh, you know, this will be compensated for the emission levels which they are emitting, countries emitting. If they are starting a project in Annex B country, they will, uh, you know, they can compensate in the emission levels. If they have exceed target level, that will be reduced. Okay, one ton equivalent of carbon will be compensated here because they have started some project. Okay, so this is something related to the clean development mechanism. Then come to the uh, last one, joint implementation. Here what happens, the two countries, like Annex B countries, which is having a target, will join their hands together and will earn the emission reduction unit, ERUs, uh, emission reduction unit from emission reduction or emission removal project in our annex B country, they will, uh, annex B country, we shall go and start a emission reduction project or emission removal project in our B country and that way they earn a M reduction unit and through this they are trying to uh, balance their emission level, okay. So, this way they are having three mechanisms to reduce the carbon dioxide emission level. And the last convention which I like to discuss is Minamata Convention, under the conventions and protocols, okay, Minamata, this is also, uh, which it entered into force in 2017, so this is fifth year, so really we are expecting a question from this uh, Minamata, so far, uh, so far UPC has not touched this convention, so anytime this may come uh, in the exam. So what is this Minamata Convention, it's nothing but which is talking about a mercury pollution only, we all know what happened in Minamata in Japan, the catastrophic pollution of mercury happened there where methyl mercury was released into the ocean and 
this led to the spread of minamata disease also okay so this killed a lot of organisms lot of uh, uh, species and that then this was kept in the mind and this convention was did and this became especially related to mercury products only this convention was brought and this became a legally binding un treaty if you see and which was adopted around 2013 but it came into force in 2017 okay and now it has around 137 parties and india also ratified this convention this convention was also ratified by india uh, and along with some flexible how we did with the, the previous one also opt out position we have went no for opting out positions related and the same way here also we are having certain flexibility in case of mercury related convention that we told that we will be continuing the use of mercury based back and uh, uh, even the processes involving the mercury compound up to 2025 we will use this okay that way we have having a flexible provision on this under this minamata convention but we have ratified it so the main objective is to protect the human health and the protect the environment from the harmful effect of mercury okay release of mercury and the mercury compounds to protect the human health so in order to meet the objective the uh, the convention is trying to control the supply and trade of mercury including settling setting setting limitation on the specific source of mercury okay such as mining activities controlling mercury added products even thermometer we are having mercury no mercury is very useful but at the same time it goes out it is completely affecting uh, our health okay now the uh, last convention so so far i have seen a lot of protocols uh, the conventions but the very important convention is united nation framework convention climate change which was uh, signed in 1992 in the rio summit along with the other two conventions united nation on biological diversity and united nation convention to combat desertification this we have repeated and again so they are intrinsically linked with one another so what is unfcc intergovernmental treaty only and uh, we need to address the problem of climate change only we have brought this unfcc okay so since this is also celebrating year wise classification you have to be very careful and it entered into force in 1994 so uh, you can see that around 197 countries uh, have now ratified this convention and we all know that there is a body called conference of parties which is a supreme decision making body for this convention they will meet yearly once and they will um, set out important frameworks or important targets or important uh, guidance will be given to the member countries and they will follow that and the last summit which took place was in egypt egypt they have conducted it and these are some of the important outcomes of that in that you have to notice that the loss and damage fund was proposed okay for what they have proposed this fund there is no clear idea about this loss and damage fund they have told that this is to help vulnerable countries which are uh, uh, you know affected by the climate disasters okay so for that purpose only we are proposing this loss and damage fund they told it this fund will be completely dedicated to assist the developing country to respond to the losses they are facing due to climate change or damage they are facing due to change that is why the fund name itself loss and damage fund okay and they said that the fund has to come to operation operation at the next summit uh, which is going, which is the, called as the cop summit 28 in that we will try to operational operationalize fund okay and come to the other important uh, uh, outcomes see this they also said that the parties also agreed for the institutional arrangement to operationalize the santiago network for loss and damage this is a network for loss and damage they have created during this this was announced long back during the cop 25 itself in the madrid session they announced this uh, santiago network but they said okay we will go we will operationalize this network long back we have proposed we will operationalize okay so this um, even the bodies network experts for who, which and all has to be a member of this for implementing a relevant approach for the uh, okay for this they, they are talking about the operationalizing the santiago network then uh, also you can see that adaptation agenda was introduced by the uh, egypt president and mainly to uh, improve the resilience for the people living in the most climate vulnerable com communities no the most climate vulnerable community or most climately vulnerable area where the people are living by 2030 we have to uh, we have to achieve this that's what i proposed as in the form of agenda okay and they also uh, see this UN climate change standing committee on finance requested to prepare a report on doubling was requested to prepare a report only they have not doubled the finance if they are giving a statement they may give that the um, uh, you know the cop 27 has doubled the finance 
the adaptation finance has been doubled in COP27. This may they may give it, but they only asked for report. They asked to prepare a report that uh, doubling the adaptation finance has to be considered in the next year, next year only, COP28. Okay, like this. And uh, you can see another one important point is uh, young people in particular were given greater prominence at the COP27. That their voices first time in the COP uh, 27 only their voices was made to hear the first of the kind called as children and youth. You know the first ever child or first ever youth led climate forum was conducted during COP 27. So first time it was conducted the climate youth led climate forum. Okay, and now uh, see this also one important point. Governments were also requested. Uh, strengthen that 2030 targets you no know, in their national climate plans every country will have that by the end of 2023 they have to strengthen revisit and strengthen the 2030 targets in their national program as well as what they have to do they have to accelerate the effort to phase down unabated coal power see this this they, they may ask unabated coal power you try to remove this they are saying what is unabated coal unabated coal means the coal power plant which is not having the cu what is ccu Carbon capture and storage that is called a CCU or CCS. Okay, so carbon capture and storage called a CCS. They say that the coal power station, which is functioning with this technology, should be completely removed. Okay, so we have we have to face it out. So that way, and also the fuel subsidy, fossil fuel subsidies also you face out that. So both ways were discussed. Specifically, they discussed about phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and phasing down the unabated coal power. Okay, so this is uh, these are some important points you can keep in mind. And also, uh, they made certain move. Like you, you can see, the G7 and the World 20 uh, launched these two joined together and launched the Global Shield Against Shield Against Climate Risk Initiative. It's an initiative. Okay, Global Shield Against Cli Climate Risk Initiative. You can surf from information related to this. And uh, uh, even they came up with the commitment of around 200 million dollars, the initial funding for this program, Global Shield Against Climate Risk Initiative. Okay. So then uh, you can also see that um, the new, in, uh, this one, this one, the new Indonesia Just Energy Transition Partnership so began, okay, which was announced at the G20 only, G20 summit, which was held, you know, parallelly around uh, uh, with the COP27, they held this meeting. So, the, this just energy transition partnership was proposed, okay. And next three years, this will continue. Even India is also going to join that. So, to accelerate the just energy transition only, we are starting this just energy transition partnership. So, what you can do from your side is that surf more about the just transition partnership and surf more about the global shield of climate risk. That's it. Just have some idea what it is. You know, some rough idea you have to have. And uh, next thing we have to move on is that, yes, see this, uh, even this point you can note that on the forest protection, no, they launched the forest and climate leaders partnership, they launched one program called forest and climate leader partnership. The aim is to unite all the people, government bodies, business people, even non-government bodies, people, community leaders, everyone to come together. To reduce the forest loss and land degradation to 30. That is the main aim of this partnership. Okay. This was also launched. Now we will move to the next topic. See this. This is uh, prevention of uh, pollution. The Water Prevention Control of Pollution Act. What and all you have to read under this. Uh, the, again this act came in 1994. So there is a possibility of asking again. So the objectives of the act is important here. The main objective is even the control of pollution in the water bodies. And to maintain the, to restore the water to the normal uh, form. You know, that is the main objective of this act. And under this act only, establishment of central board for prevention of uh, prevention and control of water pollution has to be established and state board also. So, we call the central government uh, will constitute a central board and the state government will constitute a cent uh, state board. Generally, now we have given a name for that called a central pollution control board. We have came up, uh, up a name. With the name Central Pollution Control Board and State Pollution Control Board, which is controlling all types of pollutions, okay, Central Pollution Control and State Pollution Control, which act is giving that uh, back a legal status, the uh, Water Pollution Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974 only doing that. And even the joint board also can be constituted, okay, in the governments you can constitute that. What is the function of the Central Pollution Control Board? These are some of the functions of the Central Pollution Control Board. 
the main function is to promote cleanliness of the streams and wells in different areas of the state and also to advise the central government on any matter concerning the prevention and control of water they will give advice and they also coordinate the activity of the state board and resolve any dispute if it is occurring na and they will provide technical assistance and guidance to the state boards and carry out any investigation and any research related problems and water related problems preventing and controlling all these will be done by this board and also they will try to um, modify or annul with the consultation of the state government the standards for a stream or well will be set up by the uh, central pollution control board only okay and even the nation for executing a nation wide program for prevention control or abatement of pollution will be done by this body and for establishing or recognizing a lab is uh, the control is in the hand of the so to perform any function no you are taking a sample from water body the water body the sample has to be analyzed for that you require a lab water lab uh, that way in that it has to be recognized by this only recognizing that uh, particular thing as a lab okay and even the state government uh, in consultation with the state board will have the power to uh, rest application of the act to certain areas also okay the state board uh, see again this no person shall without the previous consent of the state board establish or take any steps to establish any industry operation or process or even treatment and disposal system uh, you know which is likely to discharge sewage or trade effluent into a stream or so if it is going to discharge this effluent into the stream or land or anywhere they you, without any uh, the consent of the state board you cannot do it you cannot in, involve in that type of activity okay and even the state board or any office held by the state board has any uh, has every right to obtain information from a particular industry take the samples enter at any time take the sample inspect the industry sir okay same way these are some other functions you can see uh, even the central and the state board have their own fund they have their own fund and even some benefactory funds donations everything will be uh, grants given everything will be accepted else. okay then as we have seen seen that lab lab establishment lab is given a central water laboratory will be constituted by this board only as right now see this the plastic waste management amendment rules which has come in 20 uh, you know uh, which came in 2021 which spoke about that banning of single use plastic by 2022 so there might be a question related to single use plastic okay so it and this rule which is amended in 2021 it says that we are going to prohibit the single use plastic items uh, which has low utility you know you know what is single use plastic you can see them starting from the ear bud which you are using to the one with the like a straw which you are using for drinking a cool drink and uh, every small small straws which you are seeing you no know, these are all called single use plastic only where you are using for decorations and all small small uh, ball type of uh, plastics all these are single use plastic even the plastic cups is, glass cutleries any type of cutleries which they are making is all made uh, it's, it's all used for one time thrown out okay they cannot be recycled again so that uh, they said that this is completely causing the plastic pollution it has to be stopped by 22 this has to into effect so the what they said according to this uh, amendment rules the manufacture import stocking distribution sale and use of see this manufacture import stocking distribution sale and use of prime single use plastic including the polystyrene and expanded the expanded polystyrene commodity shall be prohibited with the effect from july 22 okay so now you have to stop all these activities okay so what and all will be uh, prohibited all the single use plastic including polystyrene also and if expanded polystyrene also should be stopped and in order to reuse the plastic bags you know the main problem is that we are carrying one time we are throwing it outside and you know, disposing it so in order to reuse the plastic bag the thickness of the plastic bag has to be increased from 55 50 microns you know in, usually it is 50 microns you are uh, giving a plastic bag increase it to 70 mic 75 micron or you know uh, increase it to 75 microns or even you increase it to 120 microns that way they are saying which which has to be uh, come to effect from december 2022 it has, should have into uh, application okay so instead of using a small very light thickness plastic bag increase the thickness of a plastic bag so that it can be used again and again so the plastic packaging waste only we are saying that packing for packing material we are saying no it is not covered under the face out see this plastic packaging waste 
which is not covered under the phase out of identified single use plastic item shall be collected and managed in an environmentally sustainable way in what way the extended producer responsibility we had no previously huh? so a producer responsibility of the producer importer and brand owner that is called as pibo as per the plastic weight man management rules protesting so they may say that as a point that the plastic packaging waste is also should be phased out as a single use plastic they may give some option so you have to be very careful only the single use plastic which is called which is in the, in the form of plastic bags or straws are phased out but the packaging waste is not included so what you have to do instead in the uh, plastic bags which are used in packaging should be collected by the uh, one the producer itself the producer is responsible for that producer importer and brand owner that is why we call this as pibo as per the plastic waste management rules they have to collect and they have to dispose it okay so then they also said that the states and the union territories have requested to constitute a special task force at the national level and uh, you know for eliminating this single use plastic as per the rules okay so this already i have discussed in one of my uh, video and i have already done it ltleds so before uh, discussing this let us see if there is some other topic we can do it now and if not we will come to the topic okay so this and all is lifestyle for environment and all is a small topic only uh, which is talking about you know long back in glasgow conferences india has proposed lifestyle uh, life movement but now they can initiative it has launched the movement around 2022 they it has been launched by our uh, prime minister so it's it started as a movement people's movement it's a, it's a global initiative we are trying to uh, do to combat climate change only that is a lifestyle conscious lifestyle has to be uh, undertaken by the every individual okay that's the main theme behind this life so instead of going for mindless mindful and deliberate utilization uh, you can go uh, you know instead of mindless and wasteful consumption you can go for mindful and deliberate utilization this is the main theme of the lifestyle for uh, environment movement where this mission is planning to create and nurture a global network of individuals called as pro planet people who will always think in such way that they are sustainably using the resources okay to adopt and promote the environmentally friendly lifestyles they will have and they are called as pro planet people and the mission main uh, main objective behind this mission is to uh, uh, you know enhance or uh, improve the circular economy use and dispose economy no instead you have to bring that use and dispose economy you have to reset use and dispose economy and has to uh, you know uh, propagate the idea of circular economy this is the main idea behind this lifestyle for environment movement reduce reuse and recycle okay so instead of going for mindless and wasteful consumption you go for mindful and deliberate utilization of resources this way people has to this is a behavior change strategy everyone has to adopt it okay then uh, see this this is something where india is not a member it's not too much important but sometimes they may give an option like india is a member of water convention okay so you have to be very careful what is this water convention is about this is a convention for protection of transboundary rivers transboundary water courses uh like lakes you take sharing the two countries border which this was adopted long back this convention was adopted long back uh, in helenski in 1992 and it entered into force in 1996 this convention is talking about uh, it's it's also legally binding uh, instrument only which is trying to sustainably manage the water resources okay so that's why this convention was brought and it requires the parties if the countries if uh, countries entering into uh, signing this convention they have to prevent control and reduce the transboundary impact use transbound water in a reasonable and equitable way ensure their sustainable management this is the main objective of this convention you have to sustainably manage the water resource and use the water resource sustainable usage of water resource has to be done between the sharing countries okay so parties which are bordering this transboundary water had have to cooperate in order to uh is in order to bring a sustainable use and management of the water resources okay but this convention will is although it's this is a legally binding instrument only okay so don't forget that it is also legally binding instrument but it will not replace any bilaterals or any multilateral agreements which are there between countries okay for uh, aquifers or for water related uh, agreements which we already entered it will not affect that and instead it will help in improving that it will try to increase their uh, implementation only okay so that's how we can see this one line is also very important related to this water convention but in depth they will not ask like this 
and you have to know India is not a member of water convention. India is not ratified for. And uh, uh, see this international partnership for, for blue carbon. This year we are, uh, we are expecting that, we are guessing that there might be any question related to blue carbon. So first let us see the what is the international partnership for blue carbon. IPBC, what it is? It is launched, this, this particular partnership was launched at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we told no, in the 21th Conference of Party, which took place in Paris in 2015. It's a very important uh, uh, meet. There only Paris Agreement also came out, no? So, this was launched during that time only. The International Partnership for Blue Cars was launched during that uh, period, 25, by nine founding partners together launched this. Now, it in includes around 40 partners and more. Uh, and it's a global network. It's not. It's a global network of governments, non-governmental organization, intergovernmental organizations, even research institutions can join this uh, partnership. From all around the world, they can be a member of this partnership. Okay. Main aim is should, is nothing but to safeguard the blue carbon ecosystems. What are called blue carbon ecosystems? So, what type of question will come from this and all? They will say that this uh, partnership. This uh, international partnership for blue carbon is a UN uh, program. They may say like that. It's not a UN program, it's a network. It's a network, it's a group of organizations where everyone be a member. Starting from a government organization to non-government organization to the research institution can be a member of this. One and only aim is to uh, safeguard the blue carbon ecosystem. So what are called as blue carbon ecosystems? As you can see, it's nothing but the mangroves, the tidal uh, marshlands, no, marsh sea grasses, all these are called as blue carbon ecosystem, which is trying to sink the carbon. The ocean ecosystem, which is sinking the carbon, is called as blue carbon ecosystem. Even you can, even you can add coral reefs. They have to be protected. They have to be sustainably managed, and they have to be restored so that so that the carbon dioxide level can be brought down. They have to be protected. At least you put them. So far, you have already damaged them. You protect them, sustainably manage them, and restore them. Okay, so this way you try to reduce the climate change effect. Eh, so the partnership is not uh, again an important point under this that the partnership is not a funding body at all. That but this partnership works to increase the international commitments. Okay, it increase the inter it works along with the international commitment only as we have talked about the water convention is also doing the same. So it is trying to improve the national policies. It is trying to create an impact on the national policies and it also gives suggestion. No, to well so and it accelerates on the on ground implementation of the blue carbon protection and restoration activities. So it will only try to guide the people. Okay, it will give some inputs to the uh, initiatives. So there is another initiative called as blue carbon initiative. The previous one which we have seen is uh, body. It's a partnership. It's, you know, it's like some a network we can say. So it's a blue carbon partnership that is. But this is a blue carbon initiative. It is. It is an initiative which was started by IUCN. Okay, so it is started by the Conservation National, it's a body, Conservation International, okay. and then IUCN, so then IUCN, and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Okay, so this is a body and UNESCO, IOC, International Inter, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. So three people join together to bring this initiative. One is Conservational, uh, Conservation International, another is IUCN and another is UNESCO's IOC. So it's a global program because it's an initiative now. So it's a program it is, which is trying to uh, mitigate the climate change. Okay, which is trying to mitigate the climate change through the restoration and sustainable use of coastal and marine ecosystems. Trying to restore, restore the marine ecosystem which got damaged. And one which is already existing, how to protect it and sustainably use it. Okay, and now we are focusing on mangroves, the tidal marshes, sea grasses, okay, same, like how in the partnerships they were, we were discussing. So, this carbon initiative brings together the governments, the research institutions, the non-governmental organization, again here also it is open to all and the, even the communities can come and join with this program, in this program and they mainly work to develop the management approaches, okay, especially for conservation, restoration and sustainable use of the blue carbon ecosystem. And engage the local people because how will you conserve? How will you conserve the ecosystems, the blue carbon ecosystems like mangroves or any, 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 like even seagrass? How will you conserve them? Only the local people will have knowledge how to do it. So engage the local people, engage, engage the international government. Through that, you can get inputs, engage the national government. 
and they also develop a comprehensive method for assessing the blue carbon stocks first of all and related uh, things like emission stocks carbon accounting this way you have to first analyze everything and then you have to develop a policy strategy in order to protect or conserve or restore or sustainably use the blue carbon ecosystem okay so now um, see this the blue bond related to the blue carbon initiative you have to know about the blue bond the challenges uh, you know mainly the sdg goal number 14 you come to sdg goal number 14 what it is talking about talking about the life under water is conserving the full form is conserving and sustainably using the oceans seas and resources for our development so sustainably you have to use them so then the blue bond was introduced blue bond is a not a new concept it was into long back so it is, it is a financial instrument which was mainly designed for the marine and fisheries projects only not only marine projects but fisheries project okay in order to sustainably manage the fisheries and marine projects we have introduced blue bond and not as a separate bond but as a bond within a green bond we have introduced a blue bond so who the first time world bank uh, has defined this blue bond is nothing but uh, what they have defined it's something a debt instrument we are issuing uh, it issued by any government any banks or even others also to raise money okay and uh, also to give to the investors to finance um, the marines marine sectors and ocean based projects you know, for that so which is going to have a positive impact environment not affecting the environment any marine project and any os project which is going to create good things a positive impact on the environment and give going to give a climate benefit for that we are going to bring this uh, uh, fund this project this money okay so this uh, in 2018 that's how world bank find that blue bond it was definition by world bank and 2018 the sicilis government uh, the republic of sicilis first time launched the first sovereign blue bond they launched and uh, mainly this bond was to uh, draw the world community you know draw the attention of the world community to end plastic pollution plastic waste pollution in the ocean it is floating and uh, that's how they launched this bond and uh, in 28 again uh, next year in 2019 world bank launched a blue bond previously they defined only 2018 the sicilis government was found to initiate the process and the world bank followed it and it it it, it announced the blue bond and around 2019 it was then uh, china became the next one to introduce this uh, bond uh, mainly like you know in the in-depth discussion and all is not required but that is china in china the private first time a private sector into a blue bond was in china only okay first and the first from a commercial bank also we can say not only from private sector from a commercial bank and even the first firm from asia from asia this was the first so china became the first one to introduce the blue bond and recently india introduced okay china introduced three years before 2020 they didn't done it india just now in 2023 sebi uh, the securities exchange board of india is there no they are the first one they strengthen strengthen the framework for green bonds by introducing the concept of blue and yellow bonds blue and yellow bonds they brought not only blue bond they also introduced another one also yellow bond uh, so blue bond was talking about the water related things management of water and marine sectors and all no, the projects related to that but yellow bond is related to solar energies so through two types of bond is introduced as a sub bonds or sub categories under the green securities okay this way we have discussed completely related to the blue bonds uh, and the blue initiatives blue carbon initiatives everything we have discussed even you can make a small note related to what is meant by blue carbon okay you yourself can surf and make small note related to blue carbon so we have left one thing uh, that lt led which was proposed under uh, cop 27 so there might be a possibility of a question arising from lt led india's long term low carbon development strategy that is called as lt led long term okay low carbon development strategy okay low carbon development strategy lt led they call this this completely as leds low emission development strategy otherwise called as low carbon development india has given in the name of lts that is low carbon development strategy it is also nothing but lt led only long term low develop low emission development this long like the countries has been um, asked to submit the lt led India in COP27 has submitted its own long term low carbon development strategy or low emission development strategy. So, here the main aim is to transit transit from the um, uh, carbon intensive sectors to low carbon development pathway. 
okay that is the main goal of india and the focus here in this particular lt led for india is that how well it is going to rationally utilize the natural national resources okay uh, related to energy security how well it is going to use uh, rationally utilize the national resource with related to energy security okay so here they are saying that the transition now we are at present we are using fossil fuels but transition will happen take place in a very smooth way in a just way we will move from the fossil fuel usage to the green fuel okay so for that only india very recently in 2021 also introduced national hydrogen mission see this launched in 2021 main aim is to uh, make india green fuel dependent country instead of using a fossil fuel okay in order to make india as a green hydrogen hub for that only they introduced okay and not only this see this uh, next to next under this in the lt led one is related to the um, energy sector what we have is related transition in the energy sector from the fossil fuel to the green fuel second they are talking about increase the use of biofuels india is saying that i am going to increase the use of biofuels especially the ethanol blending no previously we did 10% now 20% ethanol has to be there so in the petrol and all so we are to increase we are trying to uh, you know speed up the uh, target year also previously we talked about uh, uh, it has to be uh, achieved by 2030 and all now we are telling it, it, it will be done by 2025 itself okay same way we are trying to in more uh, you know uh, electric vehicles introducing electric vehicles and all this way we are trying to bring a lot of changes in the transport sector also and even we are talking about urbanization when you are talking about urbanization this third one okay urbanization the trend is from now our you know low base future sustainable and climate resilient urban development has to take place so not simply urban development but when you are doing an urban development it has to be a sustainable urban development we are talking in that way and should be also climate resilient you have to um, withstand the climate change huh? smart uh, initiatives all these are uh, put under the climate smart urbanization we can say okay and uh, planning integrated planning for cities has to be there green building roads has to be followed this way you have to enhance that uh, bring in uh, sustainable or climate resilient urban development okay then uh, to see that industrial sector also should have a uh, you know low carbon pathway okay so we are supporting a low carbon pathway in industrial sectors trying to initiate a schemes like tax scheme national hydrogen mission we are which we talked about so which we are trying to uh, bring input of using a fossil fuels and you know, we are trying to go for a clean air clean energies okay and even enhancing the forest and tree cover this is one such lt led goal in the um, uh, last three decades alongside high economic growth okay so even we are telling that forest fire is major creating a major havoc in destroying the forest and all we should try to rectify that problem and uh, you know we have to increase the carbon sink for that we have to increase the forest cover and even the last point in this is the transition to low carbon development way uh, will have, you know it will take a lot of uh, money now we have to invest more so because we have to in, uh, uh, develop new new technologies and for that we have to invest more money and new infrastructures and all is required and this will uh, this we call as transaction cost we call this as transaction cost it will uh, take trillions and dollars trillions of dollars generally so what india is uh, saying that we need a provision of climate finance from the developed countries please give us we will play play with uh, which is sorry through this we are going to use this money okay in the form of either you can provide us in the form of grant or even as a loan we will take it and we will try to improve our technologies and we will try to reduce the impact of carbon on the environment and we will turn transit to a low carbon pathway okay so this is how india committed this its ltled so there might be a question from ltled also so you have to read these six points carefully and uh, you know uh, that important related to lt led so this way i am completing my session here related to climate change and uh, the other related pollution related issues and how to mitigate this we have completed this session here so as much as topics which is required for this year i have put up for you but again small small topics will be left over here and there everything cannot be covered here but what is very important and very essential we have already done it along with the some basic concepts which has you have to know always okay that has to be done so we will meet again in the last session which has to be conducted later which way we are going to talk about the next important session thank you all